Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizing committee uh, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and talk about things that I'm really, really passionate about. Um, I would always like, also like to thank you guys for being here. This is the last stretch of the conference. I'm happy to see so many people here. I've been getting a lot of emails over the past couple of days saying, oh, sorry, I would have loved to see your keynote, but I'm going home, it's Friday. I, I'm sure you'll do a good job. And I think, oh, why, thank you. So you are here to decide whether I did a good job or not. And, uh, and if you don't enjoy this, at least I'll, I hope you'll enjoy the last lunch of the conference. <laughs> But essentially, uh, what I have been doing for a number of years is organizational interventions, and that's also what I'm going to be talking about today. And as Joe already said, thank you for the introduction, um, is that I'm very much into, well, if we believe organizational interventions uh, are the way forward, how can we do organizational interventions? Because it's not that straightforward. I'm sure you're all more than familiar with when you are in organizations, you tell people to do something and they never do what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, and, and I have to say, you now I feel there has perhaps been a, a naive assumption that if you, do, if you make a change, people automatically do what they're supposed to be doing. And can I just ask, those of you have, that have implemented a change, have you ever had things go according to plan? One? Okay, fantastic, we'll have a chat afterwards and you can tell us all what you did. <laughs> so just to give you an overview of, I've got my clicker here, um, just to give you an overview of what I'm gonna be talking about, is just give you a brief definition of what uh, do I mean when I talk about organizational interventions, um, uh, talk about the framework that we've developed for um, designing, implementing and evaluating organizational interventions, the kind of research that support this framework, and I'll talk a bit about why uh, I'm splitting it up like that, uh, and then some of the implications for practice and some of the implications for research that I see. So what do I mean when I talk about organizational interventions? Well, these are interventions that focus on changing the psychosocial work environment, or the physical environment for that matter, uh, and the health of well-being of organizational members. And that can be shop floor, it can be line managers, senior managers, but anyone within an organization. And the way we do that is through changing the way work is organized, designed, and managed. And that's what I mean by the organizational level. So we're looking at changing and work practices and procedures and policies for that matter as well. Uh, Norbert Semmer in 2011 um, did a review of organizational interventions and he said there are four focus areas. First of all, you can change the task. So how do you do the work? Uh, what is the content of the job that you're doing? You can also change the work context. So look at uh, working hours, workload, working time. Nurses, when do they work? Do they work uh, seven hours or seven days off? Uh, or seven days and then seven days off or three days and then three days off? What kind of road test do we have? You can also focus on providing role clarity, minimizing role conflict. So do you know what's expected of you in your role? You can look at changing or improving social relationships, both horizontally and vertically, so between employees and between employees and managers. More often than not, organizational interventions are a mixture of all these different foci area. And that is, of course, because if you change one thing, you also change something else. So if I provide role clarity, we also change the way we work together, change the social relationships. Participation in more, is more often than not a key element of these interventions. So we do not define up front what the content of the intervention is. This is something that's being decided and developed between employees and managers together. These interventions are recommended uh, by the World Health Organization, the European Agency for Occupational Safety and Health at Work, the International Labour Organization, both the participatory element uh, is recommended, but also focusing on the sources of poor well-being uh, rather than symptom treatment. There have been some discussions uh, over the last couple of days or some presentations about the randomized control trial I don't think the randomized control trial is the way forward for these kind of interventions. Uh, are you familiar with the RCT? 
Otherwise, there's a little figure here. So in all simplicity, you've got an intervention group, you've got a control group, one or more. You do something to the intervention group, you do your intervention, and then you compare. Do they improve in whatever outcome you have? In our case, it's well-being over and above what happens in the control group where you didn't do anything. If you see an improvement, then you can say, well, that's due to my intervention. That's all very well. Now I've told you this and we can all go home because now you need, you know, I did this intervention, participatory intervention. It improved well-being. Bingo. Black screen, that wasn't actually intentional. <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't tell you anything. It only tells you whether the intervention worked or not. It doesn't tell you what you can go home and do to replicate what I did in my study. There is a black box. And what I'm arguing is we need to open the black box and start thinking about how do we actually do these interventions. You can tell I've got an accent. It's a Danish accent. I used to work at the National Research Center for the Working Environment in Denmark, the NRCWE. And uh, it was an independent research center under the Minister of Employment. And as part of my job, I had to work very closely with the Danish equivalent of the uh, uh, HSE, the Health and Safety Executive, the Labor Inspectorate. And one of the projects I did was that they said, OK, Karina, tell us, how can we do organizational interventions? <laughs> can I come back to you on that one? So what we did was that we did a project uh, looking at the different methods that are recommended across Europe. And here in the UK, you've got the management standards, so we looked at that as well. And we kind of did a, an analysis of what are the recommendations, what kind of processes, what's in the black box um, for um, designing and implementing and evaluating organizational interventions. And we came up with this fantastic, very innovative problem-solving cycle approach that you've never seen before. <laughs> But basically what we did, it's, uh, we identified across um, the different methods that there's a preparation phase, there's a screening, identifying what the problems are, an action planning phase where you develop action plans, you implement your action plans, and you evaluate. So these were the recommendations uh, across the different uh, methods. Some had more phases, some had fewer phases, but the content was pretty much the same. The problem with these methods is that they weren't evaluated. So what I did was that, okay, so we've got this model, and then we went in and tried to find the research that supported um, these recommendations or these processes. Uh, this was a few years back. It was in 2010. Uh, and I had study leave a couple of years ago, so I thought, why don't I do an updated mo uh, model of, or a version of the model and see what has happened? And one of the good things that have happened over the last uh, seven years is uh, that there are a lot more European methods out there now. When I first started in, in well, that was in 27 to 29, we did uh, that project, uh, 2009, uh, management standards in the UK, and that was essentially the only, you know, national-wide policy. They were, then there were some methods developed in Germany and in Spain, but they were developed at universities, so they weren't actually national-level policies, only the management standards have that. Since then, there are now policies in Belgium, in Germany, in Ireland. They've taken the management standards and called it something else. Um, in Italy, they've uh, adopted the management standards as well and uh, translated into the Italian context. So basically what I'm going to do now is take you through the five phases um, and see what kind of research evidence do we have to support uh, these five phases. And... Um, that's not very strong, so you can't actually see anything, can you? No. Can you? I'm looking. No. <laughs> At least I've got big hands, OK? Uh, but basically, there are three key principles that go through all five phases. Um, participation, management, support, and intervention fit. And I'll go through those first. So participation. I lied a little bit when I said there isn't a lot of validation uh, of the different uh, policies in the countries. There is some validation, and I will be going through that, and then I'll be adding other kinds of research as well. So, participation. 
And we can have direct participation, where every, all employees are involved in designing and implementing the intervention, or indirect, where we have representatives, for example, union representatives or safety representatives. So in a study of how they use the management standards in Italy, uh, in, in AIL, they had a study that showed that 32% of 124 organizations used employee representation, and 39% had direct uh, participation, had all employees involved. How informative do you think that is? Do you now know whether you should have direct participation or indirect participation? You just know this is a number, this is how many used it. But we don't actually know whether it worked or not, or how it worked, and what kind of, how should we involve people? Um, Nadine Miller, in an evaluation of the management standard, found that trade unions played a huge role in supporting organizational interventions. Uh, another study uh, from Denmark showed that indirect representation is enough because if I'm not directly involved, I'll just go and ask Joe, who's directly involved, and he can tell me everything I need to know. So they found it wasn't necessary uh, with direct participation. I did a study a few years back uh, where we implemented teamwork to improve employee well-being. And uh, I want you to, to ignore all the different bubbles, but focus on this one on participation. Because what we did was that we measured participation. Uh, all employees were supposed to be involved in deciding what is teamwork going to look like in our work group. So they were involved in deciding um, what kind of autonomy do we want here? How are we going to work together? What kind of, of ground rules for good interaction are we going to have? And we measured that asking them, and then we linked it to our outcomes of autonomy, social support, well-being, and job satisfaction. And what we can see is that if you felt as an employee you had been involved in designing and implementing the intervention, you had increased or experienced increased social support afterwards, and in turn um, you experienced increased job satisfaction. So here we can see that if you were directly involved in the design and implementation of the intervention, you had better working conditions afterwards, or at least social support, and better job satisfaction. Key principle two, management support. We're talking about senior managers and line managers here. Um, in the good old days, there was a lot of discussion that senior managers need to be involved. But more recently, we've started arguing for line managers can either make or break an intervention, because once senior management have made the decision, now we're going to do this intervention, who has handed over the responsibility for making things happen? Line managers, of course. Uh, so an evaluation of the management standards, another study showed that, yes, management is important. But what is important about management being important? Is management need to be open to critique and dialogue? and they need to pursue progress. They need to make sure that changes are happening. There's an English study showing that initial management support is insufficient. So it's not good enough to go out and say, people, we've got this intervention. Support it. I think it's important. Go and do something. You have to continually, as senior managers, support and show uh, your support and be a role model and allocate resources to the intervention. Line managers need to provide the vision. So what can we actually achieve in this area? And they need to prioritize the project. We are all busy people. And sometimes uh, these interventions to improve employee health and well-being, they uh, can be seen as a nuisance rather than actually a support, even if that's actually what we're trying to do. And managers also need to be aware of their role as role models. There's a Swedish study that showed uh, this was a work-life balance uh, study, and um, what they found was that uh, it didn't go particularly well. They said, guys, don't read your emails after work. Don't work long hours. This is not what we expect of you. But guess what? At 8 o'clock, the managers and the line manager were still in the office, and they were sending out emails at 8 o'clock and 11 and 6 in the morning. So guess what? Employees didn't change their behavior. 
because it doesn't matter whether you say something, if you're just paying lip service, but actually your behaviours are showing that what I really want from you is you to respond to my email at 11 o'clock at night. Third key principle, fit. I'm not talking about physical fit here. Uh, I'm talking about fitting the intervention to the context, so understanding what kind of people are we working with, what kind of organisation culture do we have, uh, how can we integrate our intervention into the existing practice and procedures, meeting structures. Uh, one of the evaluations of the management standards found that in a company, the, uh, the managers didn't really use the HSE indicator tool, so the questionnaire associated with the management standards, because the perception was that, you know, employees, they don't have a problem. Senior managers, we are the stressed ones, so why do we need to give a questionnaire to employees? They don't have a problem, we have a problem. So uh, guess what, they didn't really use uh, the questionnaire. One of my favourite studies is by a former Danish colleague, where they had a, um, an IT system for planning the rota uh, for healthcare assistance in nursing homes and um, uh, working in, in people's homes. Exactly the same system, uh, so it was the same intervention, and they um, implemented it in three different care homes. In the first care home, they didn't find any improvements in employee well-being and work-life balance. And when they then went in and tried to find out, so what are the contextual factors that influence this, uh, they found that what happened at the same time uh, was that uh, the care home had to downsize, lay off people, and that resulted in people being called in on short notice. So I'm using Joe as an example again. So Joe has been told, you can come in Tuesday at 11 o'clock, that's perfect, uh, but sorry, mate, that's not going to happen because uh, we're short staff, so you have to come in at, at 8 o'clock instead. Study. And of course, then you don't see uh, the improvements. And also what they did after a while, they even cancelled the system. Um, in, in organisation B, they liked the system. They thought that it supported the existing structures. And guess what? They implemented it, and it had the intended effect in improved employee well-being and work-life balance. In the third home care, management was like, yeah, yeah, this is a good idea, we'll participate in the intervention. But we don't quite like the idea that Joe can decide when he's going to come in. So he can put his wishes into the machine and it'll give him that he has to show up at 11 o'clock. I'll just introduce a buffer zone. So I can ask you on the day to come in at 9 instead. Now what does that do? for Joe's ability to pick up his kids from school. It screws up the whole system. And guess what? They didn't find the uh, improvements in work-life balance and employee health and well-being. But to me, it's a really good example of you can have the same intervention, but if you don't actually fit it into existing structures, people can't see the idea of it, and it's been tinkered with, it's not in implemented according to plan, then you can't really expect to see uh, the outcomes that you were hoping for. Uh, some of the stuff that I have done with Swedish colleagues is to kind of integrate it into existing structures. So, are you familiar with Lean and Kaizen? So basically what we did in both Denmark and Sweden, different versions of it, trying to integrate our intervention into Kaizen. So when they're working with Kaizen, they're also thinking about what are the implications for this for employee health and well-being? What kind of activities can we do to improve employee health and well-being? <laughs> And guess what? We found where it was implemented. Uh, using the Kaizen board also had a positive impact on employee health and well-being. So it kind of tells us maybe we don't always need to come up with our own tools when we do organizational interventions to improve employee health and well-being. We can look at what systems are already in place uh, and use those instead. And tinker them a little bit, adjust them a little bit. So those were the three key principles. Then we move on uh, to the first stage, stage, the preparation or the initiation phase. So the recommendation is to establish a steering group that consists of managers, 
employees, other key stakeholders, HR, occupational health, whoever's in your organization. It can either be through existing health and safety committees, or it can be uh, committees that, that are established for the specific purpose of this project. It's also important to have a project champion or a coordinator. So the research says that, yeah, steering groups are essential. And when you have a mix of different people that can present different um, perspectives, then they work best. In an evaluation of the Belgian method, again, we've got nice frequencies here. So 51% used an internal consultant in, as, a, as a coordinator project champion. In 28% of the cases, it was the employer, him or herself. And in 21% of the cases, they um, had an external consultant. That's all very well. It doesn't tell us anything about whether it works better having an internal consultant. We simply know that this was the kind of division of who was the project champion. Some research uh, from Denmark shows that consultants are vital uh, for the projects because they take charge. They make sure that meetings are happening and what is supposed to happen is me in meetings is actually happening. There's an interesting study from Sweden where they went out and they asked human resources, senior managers and line managers about, so what did you think of the intervention? Whose responsibility was this, was it to make this happen? And uh, senior managers were a bit disappointed because they said, it's the responsibility of the line managers, but they didn't really do a lot. Line managers were a bit disappointed uh, because they thought, we'll get a lot of support from HR, but we haven't really gotten a lot, so we didn't do a lot, we didn't quite know what to do. HR, on the other, on the other hand, said, we're a bit disappointed because this was really senior managers that were going to drive this, and they didn't do anything. So they didn't agree up front who's responsible, who's the face of this, and guess what? Not a lot of things happened because everybody was expecting somebody else to do something. A Danish project in small and medium enterprises has shown that an internal project champion works if they have the necessary skills and they are trusted, they're well respected by their colleagues. Another thing to con consider in the initiation phase is readiness for change. So are people actually equipped to go through this complex decision making process? And one way of looking at that is, is, do we provide individual level training for line managers, union representatives, whoever's gonna be involved um, directly uh, to engage in this process? And the, in the evaluation of the management standards in Italy, it showed that 74% provided training as a, as a supplement. So that's quite significant, but we still don't know whether training actually did the job. Were people better? at working within the process afterwards. We have done uh, some research that shows that if you train the line manager in how to implement teams, it was the same study, then guess what? Employees report that the uh, intervention was implemented better. We see better results in terms of their working conditions and also their employee health and well-being. But what I found interesting was that we also looked at line managers' well-being. And guess what? If they have been trained in how to implement teams and manage teams once they have been implemented. And they return to a context where employees are interested and want to work in teams, then they experience better well-being. If they return to a team where employees say, no thanks, we're not interested in you coming and implementing teams with us, as at us, we don't really want to know anything about teams. Keep it to yourself what you learned on that training course they actually have worse well-being than the control group. So it's not enough to train line managers and expect something to happen. You need to make sure you've got employees on board as well. Swedish study shows, surprise, surprise, that if line managers and employees have a shared understanding of the existing learning climate, so if they agree that we've got a good learning climate, then you see uh, larger improvements in learning climate when you're trying to implement changes um, to the learning climate. 
Another important thing to consider in the initiation phase is communication. So what do employees and managers who are not directly um, involved need to know? What do they need to know? How do they need to know it? Who should be saying what to whom and how? So, <clears throat> Swedish study showed lack of communication about roles and responsibilities. Surprise, surprise. Uh, didn't lead to the intended outcomes. <coughs> a problem in a Danish problem was that even if they had occupational health consultants uh, that provided support and tools and methods, um, employees and managers weren't told that this support was available. Uh, so it wasn't being used. Um, a Swiss study showed that this was in a huge organization, many different organizations, but also in, in big, large companies. Um, what they did was that they decided, well, you decide in each your department how you're going to communicate about this project. And that seems like a good idea because then you can tailor it. But there was also a problem in that there was no profile for the intervention, so people didn't quite understand why are you doing this. There was, the, the communication kind of got filtered too much out. Uh, in another study, they found that it was a problem when new people were employed um, because there was no formal communication package. So new employees wouldn't know about the project and didn't know what, why are we doing all these different activities, what's going on here. They didn't quite understand what the purpose was uh, of the intervention. Study shows that visualization tools help keep up momentum. So if you've got posters on the walls, you are counting balls of how many action plans you've implemented and they're visible, it helps keep up momentum because it's in people's minds all the time. So now we move on to the screening phase, where you identify what the problems are within the organization. Um, Ireland. England, or UK, and um, Italia, um, Italy um, use the HSE indicator tool. How many of you are familiar with the indicator tool? Good, so a, a few people. What kind of experiences have you got with it? Have you used it? Yeah. Yeah, so you have used it as, as a consultant? Yes, internally. Yeah. How did you find it worked? Yeah, one of, one, of, one of the, what they did in, uh, uh, or done both with the management standards and, and in Italy, um, is to say that it's not always used according to plan, exactly what you were saying. They don't necessarily use the entire indicator tool, and it's not always used according to plan. Um, one of my experiences with standardized questionnaires, we have another one in Denmark, um, is that it's very difficult to translate the results of a standardized questionnaire into action. Um, and there's a Danish study showing that it's difficult to understand the results without the consultant's help. And if you don't feedback the results immediately after the questionnaire, people have forgotten all about it. Um, so that doesn't help you either. Uh, what I did when I was back in Denmark was that because I went into organizations and Danes are quite compliant and you have to do risk assessments um, use these kind of, of uh, assessments every, I can't remember now whether it's every second or third year, and a lot of organizations do that. But then nothing happens, because they can't translate uh, the standardized questionnaire into action. Uh, and I can kind of understand that. So you scored 3.5 of change. Now what are you going to do about that? It's below the national average. It's a bad thing. Do something. No. Uh, so I wanted to do something different. Uh, what we did was that we conducted interviews. I'll show more than next, next slide. We conducted interviews, developed a tailored questionnaire with items that were relevant to, in this case, the postal service. And then we interviewed them afterwards. So what did you think of this approach? And what they said was that, you know, it made sense to us because the items within the questionnaire 
were targeted to us. They made sense. We understand what the problem is with these tailored items. So it captured the local context. It also enabled them to develop detailed action plans because they could see quite easily what the problem was. And what I found interesting was that it also created ownership. So now we have responded to this, this questionnaire that's specific to us in the postal service. Then we actually have to do something about it afterwards. So they were quite happy. They managed to develop good detailed action plans um, that they felt captured the real problems. The Postal Service is a really good example because uh, we have big representative surveys and, um, and well, now they're every second year and guess what? The Postal Service always come in the lowest on autonomy. There are only so many ways you can deliver the mail. <laughs> and uh, and, and it, com it comes up in the media every time. Oh, we haven't done anything for the Postal Service workers. They have so low autonomy. But the problem is, if you go and speak to the to postal service workers, do they expect high levels of autonomy? No, they don't. They know what kind of job they're going into. What appeals to them about the job isn't necessarily 3.5 on the autonomy scale. So that's when we need to go in and talk to people. So what are the real problems that you're experiencing? And as I said, what we did uh, was that we first did cognitive mapping interviews. We had a lot of uh, colored post-its, and then we asked them, so what are the problematic areas of your job? What are the good things about your job? What are the causes behind? Why is this a good thing about the job? Why, why is this a bad thing about the job? And what, then we asked, so what do you do currently to maximize what's good about your job? And what are you doing currently to minimize the negative? And then we asked, so what could, what could you do differently to improve the good things? increase the good things and reduce the bad things. We did that and now I was quite often what you, you meet when you talk to managers is that they say, but you can't ask people what they could be done differently because then they want 10 more people employed or they want a new building or whatever. But actually I was quite surprised was that it was quite concrete and fairly, <laughs> simple is not the right word, but I hope you know what I mean. So a manager should resolve conflicts that's not something that's going to cost a lot of money. It's going to create a better working environment and, and better social relations, but it's not going to cost a lot of man money if your manager actually take that responsibility. Um, but anyway, that's, I'll come back to why I'm saying this. What we did was that we translated those statements into this tailored questionnaire, and I'm sure it's the same over here. The postal service is undergoing a lot of change because we are naughty people. We don't send letters anymore, and in Denmark it's even worse because all the public sector institutions do not, do not send letters. It's all email and e-box. Uh, so the, hardly any mail in Denmark any longer, which means a lot of changes. They have to come up with new products and services. So looking after people's summer cottages. Um, and they have to deliver mail to much larger areas. Yes, they do that. You wouldn't know. Um, so some items that we used were support for changes from colleagues. The degree of influence in connection with changes, degree of involvement in connection with changes. One of the problems was that they had an IT system planning the routes for them. It was a very clever IT system. Unfortunately, the IT system had actually been out to deliver any mail. So it was said, oh, you can cross the road here. And you couldn't cross the road there. So what they did was that they had the IT system, one of the action plans was that they had the IT system plan the route, and then they put it up on a big post-it, or a big uh, poster, and then people could comment on the route and say, no, this has to be adjusted, so this would work instead. So this is just some uh, examples of the tailored items. And what we did, rather than say 3.5 and it's below the average or above the average, we asked them about, is this a problem or a good thing in your job? And how related is it to uh, either work engagement, or job insecurity and burnout? So here you can see, well, support for changes from colleagues, that was experienced as a problem for 60%. And for those 60%, there was a three times as high risk of them uh, being insecure in their jobs. So that's a good indicator. We need to do something because it's, it has a negative impact on job insecurity and also uh, it's a problem for a lot of people. On the other hand, you can also uh, 
achieve something. Because if people think it's a good thing, they're three times as likely to be engaged in their jobs. So what we're trying to do was to give them an indicator of how can you actually uh, do something about the work environment and do good things, not just minimize the risks. And this is what they found useful. It made sense. What I thought was kind of, my god, it took a lot of time to develop this tailored questionnaire. And it's not necessarily something that organizations can easily do. So in the next project we did, we did something completely different. So we threw away the questionnaire for everything else but evaluation purposes. And we have these visual mapping models. So this is your working environment, friends. You are here professionally, socially, psychologically, and physically. You have a work task. You have some equipment to do your work task. You have a workspace. There's some demands associated with your work task. You've got a work group. You've got a line manager. You've got other teams and departments. Out here, you've got senior management, support staff, work environment. And here, you've got customers and clients. And basically, what we did was that we had people working in teams together, in their work teams. And then they would have, um, again, the lovely post-its, red and green. What are the good things about your colleagues? What are the we're on, on green post-its and on red post-its, what are the negative aspects? So they basically did a mapping of what are the good and the negative aspects of your job here. So a different way of doing screening, and perhaps one that works better in small organizations where you don't get the benefits of using a standardized questionnaire. Moving on to now we know what the problems are, we need to do something about them, the action planning phase. In the study of the 124 organizations, um, the Italian HSC found that 52% uh, of organizations developed action plans, so just over half. I don't know about you, I don't think that's very impressive. And one of the things we see, and I'm sure you're familiar with, is change fatigue. Uh, you came and asked me all these questions, and then nothing happened afterwards. Not a good thing. A Danish study showed that focus on the primary task um, led to uh, the development of action plans. And what do I mean by the primary task? Does that make immediate sense? So I'm an academic. I have a primary task. Oh, well, maybe I have three or four primary tasks. My primary task is to do teaching, to research, and to create impact. If you are in a kindergarten, you look after the children. So that's what we mean by the primary task. And they found that when, when it, the action plans focus on your primary task and how you can do your primary task better, um, that led to positive outcomes. In a Danish study, they had a few problems with developing action plans. When they came back and asked, so were the action plans the, the, the right action plans? They, they addressed the right kind of issues. Only 15% were positive about the action plans, felt they addressed the right thing. 17% didn't feel they addressed anything that they needed. And guess what? They didn't find improved employee health and well-being because very few people thought that those action plans were actually the right action plans. This is just an example of an action plan. It's really not that complicated. Uh, what resource or demand are we trying to change? What work characteristic are we trying to change? What are we actually going to do about it? What is our action plan? Who's responsible? And what's the deadline for implementing our action plan? These action plans are most often um, developed in workshops. An evaluation uh, of the management standards showed that, surprise, surprise, <laughs> workshops are seen as time consuming. Not much of a surprise there. What they also found that when it's just senior managers that are developing action plans, they don't really work. Because senior managers don't necessarily know what actually works and what the real problems are experienced by staff. In a Danish study, they used a, a fishbone approach. So basically, you had a fishbone and you have your lovely post-its. We like post-its in this field. <laughs> and they basically had on the on the good side, they had the green posters with the, with the good things, and then they had the negative. And then afterwards, they voted. So which of these 
fish bones are we going to be working with? And they found when management was in the room, I don't really want to vote openly about what I think are the real problems here. So sometimes you need to get management out of the room in order to get an open discussion about what the real problems are and what the most important problems are. They also found uh, that if you hadn't participate, participated in these fishbone workshops, then you didn't really agree to the action plans that were developed in the workshops, and you couldn't really be bothered showing up for the evaluation workshops later. On the other hand, a Norwegian colleague found that when you do participate in those workshops, you actually have a positive side effect that it leads to a, a sense of community. This is something we're doing together. An example of what we've done um, to kind of get it up there and visible is to have these improvement boards. So you've got your post-its with the green and the, and the um, red bits here. What are the problems? What are the frustrations? What kind of ideas do you have for action plans? And then you move over here to prioritize, and you can prioritize in different ways. In this project, we focused on demands and resources, um, and this little lovely air balloon is essentially you need a balance between the demands and the resources. So here, you've got the resources, they lift you up, and here you've got the demands that weigh you down. So you need to find a way, or action plans, that kind of increase your resources and uh, decrease your demands. So you can fly up and high and see the beautiful sky. Another way of prioritizing is to say, so what action plans do we have that improve well-being, but at the same time make us more productive? and enable us to do good quality work. So it's not just about improving employee well-being, it's also making sure that action plans are sustainable within the organization. Or another way of prioritizing is to say, okay, so this action plan is gonna have a huge impact and it's not gonna take a lot of effort. Those are the ones you want to be prioritizing, not the ones that take a huge effort and have very little impact. And you can either move it on to decide who does what when. Or you can bin it and say, well, we did have this idea, but once we prioritized, it's no longer a good idea. We realize it's not uh, feasible or sustainable, so we bin it. Or we don't quite know, or we don't have the resources at the moment. So we park it over here, and we can take it up at a later stage. Moving on to implementation. So, Line managers and senior managers are instrumental in keeping the eye on the ball. So once you've got your action plans, they need to be implemented, they need to be followed up upon. And in evaluation of the management standards, team level implementation is important. So you need to be discussing in your team meetings, are we actually doing something of the things that we wanted to do, that we agreed to do. Line managers who are not supported by senior managers is a barrier. So if you're just supposed to go out as a line manager and implement things, but you actually have no resources or time available to you, it's not a good thing. Um, a Swedish study showed that where action plans were actually being implemented and they were perceived, perceived, so rated as improving the uh, working conditions, then they also led to improve working conditions uh, compared to the baseline and improve well-being for that matter too. And now we're back to my model. So before we looked at participation, so do you participate in the process? Now we are looking at actual changes in, the, in procedures. So did they actually implement teamwork? And where they actually implemented teamwork procedures, we can see that there was an improvement in autonomy and also a direct effect on improvements in well-being. So it's important that you implement uh, what you intended to implement. So we use the improvement board, and now we've got our agreed action plans over here. We know who does what and when. And then at team meetings, we can move the post-its. And then when we're done, we celebrate. We completed this uh, action plan. We achieved what we wanted to achieve. The last phase, evaluation. So. In the Danish study where they had the fish bones and the managers that prevented them from voting openly, 
they did these chronicle workshops. So basically, they had a timeline, what's your story, what has been happening over the intervention period, and they mapped out what has happened, what has worked well, what hasn't worked well. So that's one of way of understanding the process that increases your learning of what, how can you do this in the future? Because, of course, it's a never-ending process to improve employee health and well-being. Some studies uh, look at the chain of effects. So actually, if you make the changes in your action plans, do they lead to improve employee health and well-being through changing the working conditions? So that kind of provides the evidence for that we are doing what we're doing within this intervention is actually what brings about uh, the intended outcome. It's not something else. One of the things that I've started arguing for is that we need to do two kinds of evaluation. We need our scientific evaluation of whether the intervention works or not. But we also need to ensure that there's organizational learning taking place. So organizations themselves have the discussion of what worked well, what didn't work well. Did we achieve what we wanted to achieve? What do we want to do differently? And also have a formative evaluation. So there's ongoing discussion. So 12 months down the line, we don't just conclude that this intervention didn't work. We actually have the discussion ongoing. What do we need to do differently? And stealing from uh, public health, I've started looking at realist evaluation. So rather than looking at whether an intervention works or not, is what works for whom in which circumstances? Because that's when we can start translating what we've done in one organization to other organizations and adapting it uh, so it would work there as well. So, the implications for practice that I see, there are probably many more, is you need to fit the intervention to the organization. So you need to develop a, a tailored strategy that works uh, for the people and the culture that you're working within. Management is important, both line managers and senior managers. You need to get them on board. They need to be active. They need to be supportive. They need to provide resources. Participation is important. You need to use the expertise of employees and managers and Involving employees creates ownership. They feel responsible for making things happen, for making changes to the way work is organized, designed, and managed. In terms of the five phases, uh, preparation, make sure that you involve people through steering groups and develop communication plans. Tailor screening, but make it simple. Our tailored questionnaire was perhaps a little too complicated, I have to admit. Action planning. Make sure that employees are involved in developing action plans. It's not management's responsibility. You have to develop something that's relevant for employees. Implementation, you need to manage action plans once they've been developed and monitor that they are being implemented according to plan. Evaluation, integrate what you're doing into existing practices. What you want to do is develop, develop sustainable changes. Um, there's a discussion of your action plans. How sustainable should they be? I'm more in the field of, of saying, well, the sustainability comes in enabling organizational members to go through these processes, because then they can do something about future problems as well. They're not just addressing the problems of this specific, uh, uh, particular project. Implications for research. What we as researchers can do is to work with organizations to develop tools and methods that can help organizations. And I have to be uh, honest and say, I didn't develop the improvement board. I didn't develop the visual mapping tools. I went to consultants and said, this is what I need. <laughs> These are the ideas I've had. This is what is in research. And the lovely people, very competent consultants, then developed the visual mapping tool and the improvement board. And actually what happened in the organization that we used it in, or the organizations, there were three of them, was that two of them liked it so much they continued to use it after our project had left. Another thing that we can do as researchers is to develop ongoing process evaluation tools. So are employees involved at different stages? Are line managers active? We can develop short questionnaires and mobile phones and send it, and employees and managers can just reply on a scale from one to five, whether they feel that they are involved at any point in time. And we can feed that back immediately to the organizations because then they can address it here now, rather than concluding at the end of the intervention, oh, it didn't work. But we also need to develop sophisticated evaluation designs that are integrating the effects and the process evaluation so we can understand how the intervention process uh, influenced the intended outcomes. 
and as I mentioned before, realist evaluation, looking at the wonderful CMO configurations, context, mechanisms and outcomes, what works for whom and which circumstances, and we need to be able to link mechanism to outcomes. And that's why I'm advocating not just qualitative process evaluation, but also questionnaires measuring the process. That was all for me.